Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the cornfields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abithar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Up into the pulpit 
gets out the sermon that he's, he's been writing for weeks, and it's a very worthy but probably somewhat dull sermon. And as he stands in the pulpit, he looks out at the boys and the, the headmasters and the, the teachers, etc. Um, he, he suddenly has this feeling, and he, he tears up his sermon in the pulpit, gasps from the, from the congregation, uh, and he preaches off the cuff. He speaks from the heart, probably in the, the first time uh, in, in his ordained career. Um, and what he says to the boys is probably a sermon that he's thinking he wished he'd heard and taken notice of when he was a boy, because what he says to them is that life is not about playing it safe. Life is not about just obeying the rules. Life is actually taking the gifts that God has given us and, and, and running with them and using them and, and doing stuff. It's not about what you avoid and what you don't do, it's about what you do do. It's a kind of a, a carpe diem, seize the day kind of sermon. And the boys love it, you know, they're, they're kind of sat there secretly reading or playing games with each other and thinking, you know, this is going to be the usual stuff, but actually they really engage with it and they really like it. Unfortunately, the headmaster and the dean don't like it because all they hear him say is obeying the rules isn't important. That they, that's, that's what they hear him say. That isn't his message, but that's what they hear him say. And so uh, he actually gets in trouble because of it. But of course, what he was really saying is, well, yes, rules are important, but actually they're not enough. Simply obeying the rules is not enough. Life isn't about the thou shalt not. It's about the thou shalt. It's about the things we do with our lives. Life is a gift. Time alive is a gift. We should use it wisely <coughs> and well, and we should, we should do stuff. So here we are on All Saints Day, and we, in All Saints, we particularly remember the heroes of the faith, the, the famous saints, who, who we remember because of what they did. We don't remember them because they were good. I mean, the word saint implies a goodness, a holiness, but actually we remember them not just because they didn't do stuff they shouldn't, we remember them, they're saints, because of what they did, what they achieved, the life that they lived. And the first line of <coughs> our opening hymn, for all the saints who from their neighbours rest. So the idea is that they're up in heaven now, and their, their work is done, and they are resting. But of course that rest doesn't simply mean that they're putting their feet up or having a kip. What it means is they are resting in the presence of God. Uh, when, when we go to heaven in the, in the next life, uh, we will, the, the joy and the pleasure of that is that we are fully in the presence of God. Here on earth, we are only partially in God's presence. God is here, but there are distractions and barriers and etc. etc. When we're, when we're, after we die, we will fully be God. We will rest in God's presence. Um, but the saints will be doing that now. That will be their, their very existence and their life. But that doesn't mean that they didn't do that while they were still alive. The second verse of that hymn says that, that God was their vision and their life and their rock and their fortress. In order to be a saint, it's not just about achieving things and doing things, it's actually about resting in God's presence, using the strength of God to help us achieve what we do. So the saints wouldn't have just all been active and doing, 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 they would have been taking time away to spend with God, quality time with God. And effectively, this is Sabbath time. This is what Sabbath time is. It's spending quality time with God. And no Christian can be efficient and active uh, and follow the calling that God has given them unless they do that, unless, unless we take Sabbath time. And that's why it's not just an optional extra, it's a commandment. One of the Ten Commandments is keep the Sabbath day, keep it holy, use the Sabbath time, use Sabbath time. And time itself is a gift and is part of creation. In the Genesis story, which we hear summarised in our Exodus reading, uh, God creates stuff, material things, but actually, he's also creating time. The, the six days of creation, God is creating the days themselves in which he then creates the physical stuff. And then on the seventh day, 
Uh, it's a day where God actually rests and takes pleasure in God's own creation and the things that God has done. And God blesses that day. He blesses the time itself. So time is a gift and is a creative thing from God. As Christians, Sunday is the first day of the week. The Sabbath day is the day that starts the week. We don't work hard all week and then receive Sabbath as a reward. Actually, God gives us Sabbath to, to begin with, to start with, because we need to rest and spend time in God's presence before we can go out and do all the stuff that we're supposed to do. And that's why it's so important, and that's why it's a commandment. In our Gospel reading, um, the, the Pharisees have completely misinterpreted and misunderstood what Sabbath is all about. They think that, like the other commandments, it's a thou shalt not commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not do anything on a Sunday or a Saturday in, the, in their case. So they're, they're treating it as a thou shalt not. And so they've, they've created all these rules about all the things that you shouldn't do on a Sunday. And for them, that's the essence of Sabbath. It's a thou shalt not day. Uh, and, and even modern Orthodox Jews, they won't use electricity, they won't drive a car, they won't watch television or read a newspaper on, on the Sabbath day. Um, so it's all about what you shouldn't do. But what, what Robert Donat is saying in his sermon to those boys, and indeed what Jesus is saying, not just to the Pharisees in our Gospel reading, but again and again and again, Jesus says, life is not about obeying the rules. That's just the starting point. Yes, of course you should obey the rules, but that's not enough. You have to do much, much more. In uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he says, you will have read in the Old Testament, in the, what we call the Old Testament, in the, in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Uh, but I say, even if you have hate in your heart for someone, that's a sin. You will have read, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I say, even to look lustfully on someone else's wife is a sin. So, Jesus doesn't just say that the rules are unimportant. Jesus says they're just the starting point. It's not enough. We should use our consciousness and our lives and the Holy Spirit to guide us into doing much, much more than simply obeying the rules. And that's effectively what he says to the Pharisees on that day when, when they pick him up or his disciples up on picking corn. Why is picking a corn work, a work? Well, because the Pharisees have decided that uh, the farming, the Gathering in crops is, is work, and so you shouldn't do it on a Sunday. They've decided that preparing food is work, so you shouldn't do it on a Sabbath. And simply by picking corn, taking the husks off and eating it, that's what the disciples are doing. So it's a sin, it's a thou shalt not. And Jesus says to them, guys, you completely missed the point. Sabbath is supposed to be a joyous time, not a time where we worry that we're going to break all rules and make God angry. Sabbath is a time for, for celebration and joy and resting in God's presence. You, you just completely got it all the wrong way round. Um, Sabbath is primarily about me. It's about God. It's about spending time, quality time with me. And that's why I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And that's why as Christians, Spending Sabbath time is, is not just something we do when we've got time to do it, or it shouldn't be. Uh, and yes, of course it's coming to church on Sunday. What we're doing now, spending time together, sharing communion together, praying, praising together. Yes, that's quality time with God. This is Sabbath time. But actually, it's not enough. Jesus, throughout his ministry, would take himself away to, to pray, to spend quality time with his father uh, during the most difficult times. Sometimes when we're really busy, we think, oh, I don't have time to pray, I don't have time to read my Bible, whatever. Well, that's, that's the very time when you should be doing it um, even more. Creation itself is a gift, uh, and we should protect it and look after it and treat it wisely and well. And obviously, we're talking a lot about that at the moment. But actually, time is a gift. How do you use the gift of time that God has given you? Are you using it wisely and well? Are you making sure you build in Sabbath days, Sabbath 
moments are you taking, if you're really busy and you say, oh, I don't have time to stop and have a prayer time in the morning or whatever, but, but when you're driving and you hear a, a song on the radio, do you allow God to speak to you through it? As you look at the scenery around you, do you, do you make that Sabbath time? Take the, the time and the advantage to do that. And that's the, this is so important that that's why it's one of our topics in our Salt of Light, and we're going to be tomorrow night uh, in the Gomshaw Club, and I hope you're able to join us. We'll look at some practical ways. If you struggle to make Sabbath time, or to think, how do I create quality time with God, we'll, we'll give you some practical tips um, tomorrow night at the Gomshaw Club, so please do come along. So, so Sabbath time doesn't have to be a Sunday. You, it's moments, hours, minutes even that you can create at different times, and we'll talk about that tomorrow night. But actually, it can be longer than a day as well. You can actually have extended Sabbath time. Uh, a sabbatical, I've just taken a sabbatical. It's, that's extended quality time. Or within my sabbatical, I did a pilgrimage. That's, that's something you can do to create Sabbath time. Uh, or you can go on a retreat. You probably know all the clergy here regularly, well, not as regularly as we should, but we, do, we, we, we go on retreats. But retreats aren't just for ministers and you know, professional religious people. Retreats are for everybody. Uh, and so I'd just like to ask uh, Rod to come up and talk to me, to, because just to show the ordinary people, not to say that Rod is an ordinary person by any means, uh, but just, just to show that it's something that anybody can do. So Rod, I wonder if you can just step up. Tomorrow night, um, I'll get Rod to tell us a little bit about the practicalities of choosing and finding a retreat. Uh, no spoilers. Uh, but, but this morning, I, I, I just wanted two things, Rod. Firstly, I'd like to ask you, um, what, what inspired you or persuaded you or encouraged you to, why did you make the decision to, to, to take a retreat in the first place? Um, during my Christian journey, I always believed in the power of prayer. And I remember a conversation with Sarah, our curate, that uh, I said to her, I pray, but I'm not so sure that I'm getting anything back. And as, as a self-confessed talker, she said to me, well, do you listen? And probably I didn't. And that's when the idea popped into my head. And, and then I went to my first retreat to find quality time where I would get away from the clutter and to be able to pray and to listen. Right. And as I say, we'll talk about the details tomorrow night, but just very briefly say, where you've been and the kind of retreat you've been on? Well, the first one was in the East Midlands, and it was a retreat where you talk, and I'll explain why I say that, because it was four days, and you had teaching sessions and group sessions, and then you had quiet times. And the bit I enjoyed most was where I'd go away with my Bible or reading material, and I'd find a, a, a nice space in the lovely grounds of Lawn Abbey where I went, and I really learned to pray. I learned to listen and I came away. It was joyous. And so the next step was, well, I'd like to do another one. And, and again, with a little help from Sarah, I went to a silent retreat and my friends were aghast <laughs> that I did. And it was for six days. And I'll admit on the first day or so, I struggled because you had a small session with a mentor, but the rest of the time was silent. But again, I found a a spot in the gardens where I would take my Bible and reading and, and I appreciated all the joys of God's presence in all the senses and it, the days went by and my connection to God just grew and grew and grew and uh, I remember I got quite emotional because when I came away I couldn't stop grinning <laughs> I, 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 this was in North Wales, it was a Jesuit retreat and it was a lovely library as well and I'd commend it to everyone. I really got a great deal out of it, and I feel closer to God, and I understand prayer better now than I've ever done before. So, so setting aside that quite considerable length of time by most people's standards, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't just great while you were there. You, you would say that it's had a lasting benefit and has changed you in some way. That's a very good question, because I'm not saying that I won't ever do another retreat, <clears throat> Excuse me, but what I've learnt is that I can get close to God now without going on a retreat. I, I go out for a day, and Susie knows I go off and I explore places, and I might go into a church, 
and I get the same connection now that I learned on the retreats. Or I can be in my car, or I, I sit in a park and enjoy the, the beauty of where I am. And the retreats gave me the tools to connect through prayer to God at any time. So it's a, a lasting benefit, not just the days I was up. Thank you, Rob. That, that's great. Thank you. Um, I, I can cut out the last bit of my talk, pretty much, because you, you really said exactly what I was going to sum up by saying. Um, the ideal is that we learn how to, the skill to create Sabbath time, because that's what you're actually talking about, to, to just create Sabbath time anywhere, in any place, in any situation. But sometimes we need to be deliberate about taking the training and the time to learn to do that. It's not easy, particularly uh, with our busy lives and our cluttered brains. And sometimes a retreat is the, is the, way, is the way to do that. Um, so time is a gift. How are you using your time? Are you using it wisely and well? Uh, in the film, Lease of Life, um, Robert Donat's character effectively gets a new lease of life he suddenly realises that he hasn't been living life to the full, that life is about more than doing, not doing wrong things. That, that, and he's, the last year of his life um, turns out to be a really wonderful one for him. The, the blessing of knowing that he doesn't have much time left actually encourages him and gives him a new lease of life. Now, we may not be in that situation, but actually life is fine. Time is precious. It, life can be snatched away from us at any moment. And so we, we should be, as Christians, using the time that we have wisely and well. And making sure that we find and develop the skills to, to use and find Sabbath time. To spend quality time with God. Yes, sometimes deliberately, dialed and set away. But hopefully we develop the skill to do it anywhere, in any place. The, the wonderful blessing of my sabbatical, uh, particularly the week in Northern Ireland, was that, like Rob, I came back suddenly finding that I was able, in, in moments, when a song played on the radio, when I saw the view out the window, if, if, at any moment, you, it just suddenly you're, you're thanking God and praising God. It becomes almost a natural way of life, and that's the goal uh, for all of us, and uh, something that I just hope that all of you here are able to achieve because it's a joy and a blessing and a wonder and it, it makes you fully alive. Jesus came to give us life in abundance, not just to live narrowly, not uh, obeying rules and not doing the things we shouldn't, but actually enjoying the wonderful gifts that God has given us in creation and the very gift of time itself. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, strengthen all Christian people by your Holy Spirit and give opportunities for us to share our belief with others. Take away fear and instill the confidence to talk wise words with those who are unsure of what they believe. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. As we celebrate All Saints Day, we think especially of those men and women in whose lives the Church as a whole has seen the power of the grace of God at work. And we give thanks for their ex example and inspirational works. The saints laboured but also rested. Help all believers find time in their lives to stop and fully understand the meaning of Sabbath. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, we pray for peace and reconciliation in war-torn countries especially remembering the Israel-Gaza conflict, the Ukraine-Russia conflict, and all other conflict zones. 
We ask that you give wisdom and discernment to all global leaders and to those in positions of power who have the ability to impact the course of wars. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, that they will know your comfort and love. We also pray for those loved ones who are missing, unsure whether they are dead or alive, that they will soon have news. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Supply trucks of food and water have passed through the Rafa crossing into Gaza, but not enough to supply the whole population. Lord, be with those who are hungry and guide the supply lorries through the crossing to those who need it most. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, in our community, be with all those who are unwell. Hold the weak in your arms of love. Surround the frightened with your tenderness and give hope and patience to those who are recovering. At this time, we pray especially for Pat Nelson and Diane Heaney and for their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we celebrate All Souls Day, we remember with thanksgiving those who gave us life or who nurtured us in faith. Gracious God, we pray for all those who have recently died, that they may find peace and new life with you in heaven. We especially remember Brian Perry. We pray for those who are mourning. Lord, surround them with your compassion. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.